Hey everyone, uh, I'm excited to talk to you today about our work on non-interactive batch arguments for NP uh, from standard assumptions. This is joint work with my wonderful collaborators, Abhishek and Jeng. So before we get into the question of assumptions, uh, what is a non-interactive batch argument for NP? Uh, consider the scenario here between Alice and Bob, where both of them have access to a common reference string or a CRS. Further, uh, Alice has k sat instances and wants to convince Bob that all of them are true. Specifically, that there's a witness for each of them such that the circuit C on input the instance X and the corresponding witness W outputs one. So the batching is essentially over multiple NP instances. So the non-interactive nature indicates that Alice just sends over a single message referred to as a proof to Bob, and then Bob can verify given this proof. In fact, we're going to require something stronger. We're going to say that the proof must be publicly verifiable, meaning not just Bob, but anyone with access to the CRF should be able to verify the proof. So the argument indicates that uh, any computationally bounded cheating Alice cannot produce an accepting proof if even one of the statements are false. Right. Uh, so without further constraints, this is actually fairly easy to achieve. Alice just sends over all the witnesses W1 to WK to Bob, who can then take the witnesses and then verify each of them one by one. Uh, so for any non-trivial protocol, we actually require that the length of the proof that Alice sends over has to be significantly smaller than the length of the combined witness of the case statements. Okay. And what about Bob's verify, uh, you know, verification time? Uh, Bob needs at the very least to read all case statements. And we say that the overhead after uh, reading the case statements is only some polynomial in the length of the proof. Okay, uh, so what do we actually know about this problem from prior works? Uh, so there's this uh, wonderful line of work started by Rangor Rotham and Rothbloom, which considers interactive batch proofs. So it's interactive in the sense that Alice and Bob now are able to communicate over multiple rounds, uh, but the security property is something actually stronger uh, that, uh, you know, Security is required to hold even against a computationally unbounded cheating Alice. So this line of work essentially constructs uh, interactive batch proofs for uh, this class UP, which is a subclass of NP where each statement has only a unique witness. And then we have the same non-interactive arguments or snarks for NP. Uh, these are non-interactive arguments where the length of the proof is significantly smaller than the size of the NP witness. So now if we were to take our uh, batching of sat instances and write it as a single language uh, defined here, you know, it's a natural way of uh, writing this language out. We just concatenate all K instances and the corresponding witness is the concatenation of the K witnesses. And then the snark property essentially gives us, uh, you know, a non-reactive batch argument because the length of the proof is going to be significantly smaller than the length of the combined witness. Unfortunately, we know of SNARKs for NP uh, based on these uh, strong non-falsifiable assumptions or in the random oracle model. We actually re relax the requirements from the verifier for it to be designated verifier, meaning that only a designated Bob can uh, verify the proof. Then we actually have non-reactive batch arguments for NP based on fairly standard assumptions, uh, starting with this work of Brakeski, Holmgren, and Kalai. And if you want to go to the publicly verifiable setting, we have this wonderful recent work of Kalai, Pan, and Tenyan, who consider, uh, you know, construct non-reactive batch arguments for NP based on new non-standard assumptions. Uh, this sh I should note that these are falsifiable assumptions on groups with bilinear maps. Uh, so given the state of affairs, it's natural to ask uh, then, you know, uh, non-interactive batch arguments for NP based solely on standard assumptions. And in our work, we show that assuming the quadratic residuosity assumption, uh, in addition to either the learning with errors or sub-exponential hardness of the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption, there exists a non-interactive batch argument for NP where the size of the proof uh, grows roughly square root in the number of instances times the circuit size, where the circuit is the circuit in the corresponding definition of the SAT instance. 
uh, you can see that uh, with uh, large values of k, this is actually significantly better than the tribute solution. Um, so I won't have time to go over all the details in our paper. So let me start off with some key insights. And what we actually want to do is leverage all this exciting recent work uh, surrounding the Fiat-Shamir transformation and specifically the security of the Fiat-Shamir transformation. So for those unaware, uh, Fiat-Shamir uh, transform lets you start with an interactive protocol between a prover and a verifier where the verifier's messages are just random strings. And then it allows you to make it non-interactive in the CRS model where the CRS simply contains a description of the hash function. And so the prover can generate the verify messages non-interactively by applying the hash function the present in the CRS uh, on the transcript so far. And this is publicly verifiable since anyone with access to the CRS can verify the proof. So the security of this transformation has seen like some really, really exciting recent progress, uh, you know, with connections to this correlation tractable hash function. And there's some really cool work. And as you can see, this is a long line of work. And I will touch upon this uh, briefly later on in the talk. Uh, but for now, let's focus on the communication in uh, both the protocols. As you can see, the total communication from the prover to the verifier remains unchanged um, with the transformation. So that gives us the following idea. Let's start with an interactive protocol for batch NP. Uh, then hopefully we can apply the future new transformation and then use uh, hopefully one of these, uh, you know, these cool, exciting uh, recent works and prove security of the transform protocol. So unfortunately, uh, for all of these works, uh, you know, the security is only proven if one starts with a protocol that's statistically secure. Uh, these are also called interactive proofs. And as you're seeing, these mean that even an unbounded cheating prover should not be able to convince a verifier of false statements. Uh, I should note that there's no inherent reason for this requirement. This is just what we know from the state of art. So you might say, okay, this is not so bad, but like I already indicated based on the prior works that we don't actually know of interactive proofs for batch NP. The best way that we have is for uh, UP. So instead we choose a different starting point for applying the future new transformation that we call uh, dual mode batch arguments. So since the resultant protocol is any day going to be in the CRS model, let's start with an interactive protocol in the CRS model that's going to achieve computational security, meaning that any computationally bounded cheating prover cannot convince the verifier of false statement. So where's the dual mode? So the dual mode comes into how the CRS is generated. So what you have on the left is the normal mode uh, of the CRS generation. And this is the mode that's used with the actual protocol execution. And what you see on the right is the trapdoor mode specified by some index i, and this is going to be used solely in the security proof. So for starters, you shouldn't really be able to tell which mode the CRS was generated in, uh, especially if you're computationally bound. So what's so special about the trapdoor mode? So the trapdoor mode guarantees statistical security at index i, meaning that even a computationally unbounded cheating prover cannot make the verifier except if the ith statement is false. So for all intents and purposes in the trapdoor mode, at least for index i, what we have on the right is an interactive proof. So this then provides the following security intuition for applying the future transformation to dual mode batch arguments uh, when the prover is trying to specifically cheat on the ith instance meaning that the ith instance is actually false. So we make this computationally indistinguishable switch to the trapdoor mode at index i you know, for the CRS. And then hopefully we can rely on the field streaming transformation uh, because you know, we've just talked about how this uh, trapdoor mode CRS protocol is actually statistically sound. And then you know, we have uh, a non-interactive protocol. So what does this uh, dual mode batch argument look like? So recall that the prover is trying to batch proof uh, K statements and we have uh, you know, K witnesses W1 to WK, uh, each of length M and we're gonna write them out in these uh, rows that you see here. Uh, the CRS in our dual board match argument is just going to correspond to a commitment key K and we'll see shortly what this commitment uh, scheme is. Uh, and the next thing that we're going to do is we're gonna have the prover commit 
to the witnesses in a column-wise fashion, meaning that each CJ is a commitment to a k-length vector. So there are m such uh, CJs, and the prover then sends across C1 to Cm uh, to the verifier. Uh, we require the length of uh, this commitment uh, depends only polylogarithmically on k. So next, the prover and the verifier interact uh, we have this information theoretic component, meaning that it doesn't require any cryptographic assumptions. We leave this as a black box for now, and I'll come back to this later on. And then uh, some function f, which is determined by this information theoretic component, is specified. And the prover is required to open uh, the function f applied to each of the witnesses. And then there is some final checks performed by the verifier. So what about this uh, commitment scheme that we have? So the commitment scheme that we're going to use is going to be a somewhere statistically binding commitment scheme. So these commitment schemes have already an inbuilt trapdoor mode. So if you specify an index i, you get a commitment key ki star. And if you use ki star to uh, compute the commitments, then it's statistically binding at the index i. Uh, meaning that uh, with high probability, there is a unique opening to the ith position of the vector. So given how the, you know, the commitments have been structured, what we essentially have is if each of these columns you use ki star, you have a single row that's statistically binding here, it's going to be the ith row. So we have a, it's statistically binding at wi, and now if you look at the rest of the protocol in the trap mode, everything is information theory. So for the ith instance, we have uh, an interactive proof as desired. So to be actually able to compress it, we want this information theoretic component to be future friendly so that we can essentially use uh, some prior works and then compress it uh, using a hash function based on the LWE or sub-exponential DTH. And I'm gonna talk about this next. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, we are going to actually also construct uh, these some SSK binding commitments with an appropriate opening to F uh, based on the quadratic reciprocity assumption. And I'll come back to what F is and we'll uh, touch upon this uh, later on again. Okay, so in whatever remaining time I have, let me give you some technical details regarding the information theoretic uh, component that we use in our protocol. Uh, so recall, this is the template that I just showed you, and we have this information theory component that I said I was going to talk about. So the first thing to note is that we're not just going to have one information theory component. We just we're going to have k copies of the same information theory component and correspondingly k openings. And uh, you know, for the purposes of this talk, it suffices to look at a specific uh, a single copy of uh, this. Uh, information theoretic component, specifically the ith copy, because that's mainly what I care about proving security. But before I can go uh, into any further detail, I need to take a small detour and revisit something that I earlier mentioned in the talk uh, regarding the future me transformation. Uh, remember, this is the slide that I've shown you for the future me transform. And how does one really go about proving the security of this transformation? So let's look at the interactive protocol on the left. Uh, and let's uh, define this notion of a set of bad betas. So what does that mean? So once uh, alpha is sent for statements that are not in the language, we say a beta is bad if there exists a gamma that leads the verifier to accept. So, you know, verifier is accepting on false statements. So in the interactive setting, the prover has no control over the betas. It sends over an alpha and the verifier sends over a random beta. But that's no longer quite true in the non-interactive setting because what the prover can do is it can try different values of alpha until it reaches, uh, gets a, a beta that it likes. So essentially for security, we want that uh, any computationally bounded cheating prover cannot find an alpha such that it results in a bad beta. So if the hash function satisfies this condition, we say that the hash function is correlation intractable for bad betas. So this is then the following uh, template for uh, proving a protocol uh, 
with the fear chimney transformation. So we start with the protocol that has the set of corresponding bad betas, and then uh, we then have a hash function that's correlation and tractable for this set of bad beta. And that gives us a transform protocol that's uh, secure. So we actually need to construct uh, these hash functions H. And so what do we know about them? So it turns out if this set of bad betas can actually be computed in polynomial time, then this wonderful work of uh, Baikerch and Shehan uh, show us that uh, you can construct these hash functions simply based on NW. And if further uh, these bad uh, betas can be computed in low depth, specifically in PC0, uh, and these are circuits that are polynomial size, but have constant depth uh, with threshold gates in them, then you can actually construct such hash functions simply based uh, on some exponential DDH. And this is wonderful work, uh, recent, very, very recent work by Jen and Jen. So uh, given this understanding of, you know, what kind of bad uh, betas and what kind of assumptions that we have. So if we want this uh, information theoretic component to be future family, probably all we need to show is essentially that the corresponding bad uh, betas can be computable in PC0. Um, so the building block of this information theoretic component is going to be this wonderful protocol introduced by Shetty called uh, Spartan. And specifically, we're going to focus on the information theoretic component of the Spartan protocol called Spartan Core. So just for context, uh, you know, Spartan is an interactive protocol used to prove NP statements. So in the Spartan protocol, note that the function f is simply a linear combination of the bits of the witness. And the coefficients of the linear combination, which are the sigma j's, are specified by the Spartan code. So for those familiar, uh, the Spartan code primarily consists of the sum check protocol, uh, but you know, for this talk, I'm going to keep it at a very, very high level. And I'm going to say that what the prover sends across in most messages is some polynomial G of X. And what the verifier sends across is a random beta that it samples from some specified uh, field F. So we talked about bad beta. So how do we define the set of bad betas? The set of bad betas is defined to be all the roots of this polynomial uh, G of X minus G star of X. G of X, as you can see, is clearly the polynomial that the prover sent. And G star of X is the true polynomial an honest prover would have sent. Um, I won't go into the details, but this is how, essentially how G star is defined. So in our work, we show that uh, once you start with an appropriate field F, um, the set of bad betas can actually be computed in PC0 for the Spartan core protocol. I want to reemphasize that, you know, this is a very, very high level overview of both the Spartan and some of the ideas that we use in our work. And I would defer you to the paper for details. Okay, so putting everything together, uh, we saw that the function f uh, for our protocol is simply a linear combination of the witness bits. Uh, so in fact, what we have is, uh, or what we require is a SSB with linearly homomorphic opening that we construct based on uh, quadratic reciprocity. Uh, it actually requires some additional properties that I'm really not going to get into because that's going to make things a little more complex. Again, uh, you know, I request you to look at the paper for further details uh, about that. And then uh, for the information theory component, we run K copies of the Spartan core uh, and show that uh, the set of bad betas can actually be computed in PC0 for this. So this then results in our main theorem, which I have restated here. Uh, and I uh, just want to say that in uh, follow-up work, uh, we actually uh, construct batch arguments for NP with improved parameters. And you know, furthermore, we actually show that uh, you can apply these batch arguments to construct delegation schemes for all polynomial time computation. Um, and that's all I have today. Uh, feel free to send me or any of my co-authors uh, for that matter, an email if you have any questions. And one of us will also be available to answer questions during the live session.
So thank you so much for listening.